Well friends, a, a warm welcome as you join me again this Wednesday evening for a time studying God's Word. I'm very glad you're able to do that and uh, I just ask you to join with me in prayer at the outset of this time together. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we rejoice, Lord, in the love and the mercies you have shown to us this day, the blessings you've brought into so many of our lives and the ways you've helped us in our times of need. We come tonight with the privilege of opening up your word of truth, that word which in the power of the Holy Spirit makes men and women wise unto salvation, that power that also brings new life through the Holy Spirit. And we're thankful, Lord, for the precious gift of life that so many of us enjoy in Jesus Christ and that reality of a life that is eternal. Bring us, Lord, tonight to appreciate afresh your mighty power to bring life and awakening to the life of your church. And so, Lord God, take us to the scriptures that we may find blessing and teaching and instruction and challenge in every word we study. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, last Wednesday evening, I mentioned to you a video that I'd seen uh, in which an American preacher was saying that he had had a prophetic word. A word which declared that following on from this present time of crisis and worldwide pandemic, God would send a time of great worldwide spiritual awakening. Now, without passing any judgment upon his prediction, I did point out then that both history and scripture show to us that sometimes great crises do lead to people crying out to God for mercy. Other times, sadly, the passing of a crisis leads to them merely returning to their old ways. And yet in the hearts of many, many Christians, that desire for a new time of spiritual awakening is something we truly long for. And so we began to look at what it would mean if we were to experience a spiritual revival sent from God. And last time we looked at that well-known passage of Ezekiel chapter 37, where God gives Ezekiel a vision of how a valley of dry bones, lifeless and dead, could be brought back to life through the proclamation of God's word and the calling in prayer upon the power of God's spirit to bring new life. This evening I want us to continue on that similar theme, going to another scripture in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel chapter 7, where I want us to read together verses 1 to 13, where we see an example of God turning the hearts of his people back to him and bringing a new day of blessing out of a lengthy period of spiritual decline and apathy. So if you have your Bibles, will you please join with me in reading from God's word, 1 Samuel chapter 7 from verse 1 to verse 13, the word of God. And the men of Kiriath-Jerim came and took up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. And they consecrated his son Eliezer to have charge of the ark of the Lord. From the day that the ark was lodged at Kiriath-Jerim, a long time passed, some twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreth from among you, and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and they served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah, and drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on that day, and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. 
Now when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. And Samuel was offering up the burnt offering. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion. And they were defeated before Israel. And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as below beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen, and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Amen. And we know God will bless the reading of his precious word. Friends, to get a grasp of the significance of what's happening here, I think we do need a little bit of a, rem a reminder of the background of what has gone before in the previous chapters of First Samuel. And really there are two strands of a story woven together. In chapter 1, we, it begins with the story of a godly Israelite woman named Hannah. A woman who was barren and childless and had been crying out to God each year for the gift of a son. In due course we see God answering her prayer in the birth of her first son whom she names Samuel. In thankfulness, she also pledges that she will give her son to the Lord all the days of his life. And I guess many of us are familiar with the story in, in chapter 3 of how Samuel, as a young boy, was, was taken to be in the, the house of the Lord, uh, to serve there uh, alongside the priest of the Lord, a man called Eli. And how on that occasion God called young Samuel into his service. That's one strand. The other strand of the story is this, and, and we get the clue about it actually in the very first verse of chapter 3, where it tells us that the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There were no frequent visions. There was a time of spiritual lifelessness and decline. And in many ways that should come as no surprise to us if we had read chapter 2, because it told us not only about the ineffective leadership spiritually of this old priest called Eli, but also of the shocking example and life of his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who were corrupt and ungodly men and who were under God's judgment. And that ineffectual spiritual leadership was reflected then in the national life of God's people Israel. Continually, they were under threat from their enemies, the Philistines. And often the response they made to that threat was, well, completely wrong-headed. One particular incident is highlighted in these chapters. When the Philistines had come against them and threatened them, they believed that if they were to take from God's house the Ark of the Covenant, which was historically the, the place where the presence of God dwelt amongst his people uh, above the mercy seat of the Ark, that if they took that into battle, they would defeat their enemies. The reality was that they couldn't simply manipulate God and, and use him for their own ends. And they themselves were defeated and the ark was captured by the Philistines. It was a time of national shame for Israel. It also, mind you, became a time of trouble for the Philistines because uh, during the time that the ark was with them, God sent a plague among the Philistines and soon they, they wanted the ark sent back to Israel and they, they put it on a cart 
uh, led by oxen and, uh, and sent it back once again to the people of Israel. And yet, the interesting thing is this, that while you ex would expect that that would be the point where Israel had realised they were wrong and would have come and repented before the Lord and renewed their commitment to him, in actual, sense, in actual fact, they simply seemed to set God aside once more. This ark uh, that would have symbolised the power and the presence of God among his people, instead of being taken back to its place, rightful place in, in, in the Lord's house at Shiloh, it was, we're told it was taken to the, the home of a man called Abinadab, and there in his home at, at Kiriath-Jerim, the, the ark simply stayed for some 20 years. It was as though they, the people of Israel felt it didn't matter much to them. They could manage to get on with their religion when they needed to. They could do so without too much serious commitment or obedience to God's word. And that was, in many senses, their downfall. And here in chapter 7, we meet a people who have believed, yes, they could just go through the motions of religion, but manifestly were lacking the blessing of God. So much so that continually it seems still their enemies, the Philistines, were a source of trouble and threat to them. The enemy was always at hand. So what would be the solution to it all? Well, the first hint of a solution is found here in verse 2, where it does seem that despite the ark of God being almost forgotten, there comes a time when the people realise something is desperately wrong. And they start, the Bible says, lamenting after the Lord. The cries of their hearts begin once more to rise up to God. And it's at that point the Lord then sends Samuel, the leader he has been preparing, to come and minister to the need of the people. I want us to note the things that Samuel does here and that they did the people of Israel do that lead them to a place of spiritual awakening, a place where the blessing and the power of God in their midst is restored. And the first thing we see Samuel doing here is setting before them a call to an undivided commitment to the Lord. Look at verses 3 and 4, will you, again. Samuel says, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods among you and the Ashtaroth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. Do you see those things? Firstly, Put away anything that has become a substitute for the Lord himself. And clearly in the life of Israel there were actual idols and foreign gods that many of them relied upon. Perhaps the fertility gods of the pagans. They looked to those for, for, for blessing and provision year by year. Those needed to go. They were rivals to the Lord. Now you might say, well, what, what does that mean to us? Because... We, we don't have foreign false gods that we worship, do we? But we do often of those things, don't we, who, which we tend to substitute in our affections for the place that the Lord should occupy. Even Christian people, I think, are caught up to a measure in the materialism of the world. They love for material things the desire for success, the, uh, the, the comfort we take in having as much leisure and pleasure and money as we can. Uh, sometimes we take things that are just perfectly good, uh, like our commitment to our work and to our families. And we can allow those things to become so superior in our lives that the one person who consistently gets squeezed out is the Lord and the time we spend with him and the commitment we give to him sometimes becomes minimized so there's always I think for God's people in any age a threat a danger from the idols that can so easily creep in to our lives and replace our total commitment and devotion to the Lord 
but the God is calling here for an undivided commitment to him and to him alone. And Samuel says, if those things are fulfilled, then he says, God has a promise for you. And the promise is this, he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. The thing that's most threatening to your life as a people of God, God will deal with it and uh, and take it away. But the Lord through Samuel was demanding no half measures in the repentance and the commitment of his people. He was saying, put those things away that are rivals to God. Return to the Lord with all your heart. Serve him only. And we read in verse 4 with great encouragement that that's exactly what Samuel got from the people. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth and they served the Lord only. Now that in itself you might have thought was pretty good and should have been enough. But Samuel wanted something more. He wanted all of that affirmed publicly and in practical ways. Because sometimes it's easy, isn't it, to... to say words of commitment and to pledge ourselves afresh to a a, a new and deeper love for for the Lord and, and make promises even and then carrying them through is another matter. Samuel therefore was going to lead the people here in making public their new commitment to the Lord and firstly We read in verse 5 that he would pray for them. Then Samuel said, gather all Israel at Mizpah and I will pray to the Lord for you. In his commentary, Walter C. Kaiser makes this point. He says, let it be marked down as an extremely important principle that there can be no real lasting work of God in revival without a genuine work of intercession on behalf of the people of God. Samuel, he says, was God's man who would stand in the gap and perform this ministry of a mediator. Now that's interesting, but you might say to me, well, surely we do not need a a mediator today. Uh, We read Paul's letter to Timothy and we're told there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. We can come directly to God through Christ. And that is true, that any of God's people and all of God's people are called to be intercessors for God's blessing. Yet so often there are times when it does need to start with one or two who will give the lead. And so often that has been the way when God has begun a great work of spiritual awakening in any part of the world. He started with one or two or a very few people. One example, 1857, God began a great work of spiritual awakening in New York City. But he had one man who was really the catalyst for what happened there. His name was Jeremiah Lamphere. He was a city missionary who'd come recently to the city. And he believed that he should advertise a, a noonday prayer meeting to be held each Wednesday in a particular church in Fulton Street in downtown New York. He hired the room. He had sent out invitations and so on. And he waited 5, 10, 15, 25 minutes went by until no one turned up. And after, we're told, half an hour, six others came, one after the other. They prayed together. The next week, there were 20. And from that, six initially and then 20, there began a very powerful work of God so that ultimately, within six months, 10,000 businessmen in New York were meeting every day to pray for revival, to stand in the gap, to intercede for the spiritual need of the land. And we're told within two years, a million converts had been added to the American churches. How important God has men and women who will stand up and be the intercessors on behalf of the people. And it might begin with just one or two. It might begin with you, some of your friends, who are ready for that kind of commitment. 
But back to Samuel for a moment. Notice the four things in which he led God's people Israel in that public demonstration of what would we might say is the reality of their repentance. The first of those things is a little bit unusual because we're told here, if we just read this verse together, you'll see. We're told they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. Now, why was the very first thing they did to draw water and pour it out on the ground? We're not absolutely certain, but probably the symbolism is this. That is, water poured out on the ground cannot, in a sense, be retrieved. You can't take it back. So that's the kind of commitment that these people were wanting to show and Samuel wanted them to show that day when they gathered before the Lord. They made a fresh commitment to return to him and they weren't going to go back on it. He then led them in a time of fasting. Now fasting is meant to be a time when we deny the, the needs of our bodies for food so that, number one, we can focus more upon the Lord and we can sometimes prove that the reality of the depth of our commitment to the Lord, and indeed our, in this case, our repentance before the Lord. There are times, of course, in Israel's history where the prophets actually rebuked them for simply engaging in fasts that were nothing other than a meaningless ritual, just something they did. Uh, almost believing that by fasting they could earn God's favour. That's not the case here. Here the case is fasting. Is, is evidence of a, a willing to relinquish everything that they might devote themselves to the Lord, even for a time, the need for food. And then there's this sense of leading them in a spoken repentance of their sin. We're told here that they said before the Lord, we have sinned against the Lord. We'll maybe look at this in, in some of the weeks to come, but that is again a feature of, of many a revival situation. When God's Spirit moves and deeply convicts people of sin, sometimes the, the thing that's most memorable is the public confession of people's sins and their absolute brokenness before God as they confess how they have in the past turned their hearts away from him and sinned against him. And here there's that public acknowledgement of sin. The fourth thing we're told about is, is just at the end of the verse. And we're, we're told that Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. Now as a, a judge, Samuel of course was a, a leader and an administrator of God's people. But there's maybe also this sense that he was in this occasion realising not only did they need to speak public words of repentance. But there were things that had been wrong within the life of their community. Uh, between people between people and God. Uh, and there were things they now needed set right. Where injustice had been done, things needed to be put back in order again. If there'd been dishonesty, if, there, if there'd been any kind of thing for which restitution could be made, then they needed to prove in doing so the reality of their repentance. Here's the good bit though, that comes after all of this. It's how God responds to the true repentance and desire of the people to turn back to him. Because we're told in verse 7 that even as they were gathered there at Mizpah, the devil had begun his work again. And the devil was putting it into the hearts of the lords of the Philistines to come and attack the people as they were gathered in this solemn assembly. And we're told that when the people heard of the encroaching of Philistines again, they were afraid of the people of the Lord, uh, sorry, the people of the Philistines. But what did they do in verse 8? And this is most interesting. We're told this. The people of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. They knew the one thing that was key to their protection and to the driving back of God's enemies and to the blessing of God's people was the continuance of intercessory prayer. That was such a difference, wasn't it, from those days in the past when the people in their apathy and spiritual 
unbelief had felt they could just manipulate the Lord. They, they could carry the ark of a covenant into battle and somehow God would be bound to bless them. Now they knew that was foolishness. That was done in unbelief. What they needed now was not to try to use God, but to call upon God and to seek his mercies and his help and his deliverance in time of need. And God did not disappoint them because we're told in verse 10 that as Samuel was offering up a burnt offering to the Lord, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel, but the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion and they were defeated before Israel. In the end of the day, the only thing that will bring victory to God's people and that will bring renewed blessing and will drive back the work of the, our spiritual enemies and destroy the works of the devil is a sovereign work of God's might and God's power amongst his people and for the defeat of their enemies and his enemies. And not only was there a spiritual awakening that day in people's hearts, but a whole new spiritual commitment and joy brought into the life of the nation. Samuel uh, was conscious of that and it led him, we are told, uh, to set up a stone uh, of remembrance of that occasion. He called the stone Ebenezer, uh, which meant this, till now the Lord has helped us. He wanted the people to remember continually that the one person who would be their deliverer and their salvation would be the Lord and no one else and nothing else. And we're told indeed that from that day on the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the, hand, the territory of Israel and the hand of the Lord was against them all the, the days of Samuel. The work of God that had begun in that fresh day of, of spiritual awakening was carried forth in days of blessing and days of security and days of prosperity for the work of God's kingdom for years to come. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that what we long for in our day? Now, you know, when we come to read a passage like this, we, it's sometimes too easy when we read a, a scriptural passage like this and we can say, but it's not quite like our situation. Oh, oh yes, our, our enemies seem to come against us in these days and there's no question that in our militant, secular, humanist world there are those who are oppressing God's people. There are those who are trying to impose their immorality upon our society. There are those that are seeking to silence the church's witness. But you might say, ah, oh, but are we really as apathetic and far from God as the, the people of Israel were? Well, sometimes it might just surprise us. But one thing's sure, when we face a day such as we live in, the thing we truly need to do is get individually and corporately as a people on our knees before the Lord. And back to that place where we call upon his name, where we dedicate ourselves to him in an undivided, unreserved way, where we confess our sins. Because let's face it, if God's people do not confess the sins of the nation and call upon the name of the Lord. The indifferent, apathetic people will not do it. And certainly the worldly and ungodly people will not do it. The cries for God's mercy and the intercessions for God to come and intervene and rescue and deliver have to come from the hearts of those in whose heart God has placed a desire to seek him. And I pray that that's you and that that will be me. Amen. I want us to take a little time just to pray uh, together now. Not just thinking about these things, but a couple of other things. Just in our congregational life today, I've just learned of another family who are dealing with bereavement. Uh, Derek and Sandra Weir and their children, Anona and Daniel, have, are again dealing with bereavement. A very short time after suffering bereavement before, uh, Derek's dad died just a, a number of weeks ago before the time of lockdown and and now today his mum who has been very ill and in a nursing home has passed away we want to remember that family just before the lord as we pray 
The other thing that began at the end of last week uh, was it, it, throughout the world for Muslims the, the time that's called Ramadan. Time of course of special fasting in their part and, and, and devotion uh, as they would see it. But it's a time when God's people, Christian people, are called upon to intercede for the Muslim world and to pray for the protection of, of Christians in that world, especially those who are new in their faith, especially those who have left Islam to follow Christ. Particularly just in, in open doors, a uh, little prayer bulletin today, uh, indeed that there, and for the last few days, they've been asking us to remember North Africa in particular. There are mentions one uh, person who heard about Jesus through social media and has kept her faith secret for fear of violence from her father. Again, another girl, aged 22, a secret believer who's the daughter of a, an Islamic imam. Recently her, recently, her father found her Bible, threatened to kill her. But she managed to escape and has been put in contact with open doors. So to remember God's people in those situations today, I think we should do that at this time. Let's pray together once more. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the God of supernatural power. And in so many times when your people have felt their weakness and known their great, great need, known the oppression and opposition of the, their spiritual enemies, they have called out to you, they've cried for your mercy, and you have begun a, a work that has turned into something wonderful and powerful when just even it began with a few people calling upon your name with earnestness this one, and with real commitment and real repentance. And we're praying, Lord, for that in our day, that you will stir up in our hearts that same spirit that was in the heart of the prophet Samuel and in the heart of the people of Israel to whom he ministered. We pray, Lord God, that we will live to see in our day a day when the powers of darkness will be driven back by the mighty power of God thundering from heaven, by the outpouring of your Holy Spirit, reviving your church. And we know that will be necessary in all of that, that we be the people who do the work of intercession. So create that burden and for prayer in the hearts of many of your people this evening. But likewise, we take this time to call upon you for others, particularly we know to be in need tonight. We remember our suffering uh, Christian brothers and sisters in parts of the Islamic world at this time. We think of just these two recent converts to Christ that we've read of in, in this prayer bulletin whose lives have been placed in danger, who fear for their safety, but who are strong even yet in their commitment to Christ. Will you protect them, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit? And will you grant that throughout that northern part of Africa, a place where in, in, in many days gone by, the gospel did flourish, that you will come again with your power to to build your church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against that work, but that we'll see people added continually to the kingdom of God in these days by the, by the mighty rebirth that God the Holy Spirit brings. And we pray that even especially during this season of Ramadan, when Muslims are committing to a particular time of devotion, that, they, that this will nonetheless be a time when you speak by your mighty power into their lives so that they are turned away from their, the, the falseness of their faith to the living and true God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We remember two personal needs in our homes and families and congregation at this time. Remember especially the Weir family tonight who once again are bereaved, that you will comfort them in the power of your Holy Spirit and carry them up in your everlasting arms in this time of great sadness and loss. For others too known to us tonight who are distressed by recent bereavement, by personal illness, uh, by concerns even about the, uh, the situation we're living through in these days of pandemic. Some are anxious for friends and family and loved ones working in the front line of, of medical care or in other essential services. We're praying, Lord, for your divine protection and we're praying for your mercy again, for deliverance from this time of, of trouble. But more than that, deliverance of a people whose hearts would turn back to you and seek you the living God, and know the hand of your blessing restored among them. We ask these things in Jesus, our Saviour's name. And now may his grace and mercy and peace, though all that, that which comes from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, rest and remain with us tonight and forevermore. Amen.
Friends, thank you for being with me this evening. May God bless you and may God encourage you as you seek him continually in the place of prayer. Thank you.